Well, yesterday we began talking about uh, 1 Timothy, or excuse me, 1 Peter 4.12, where uh, Peter writes to us and tells us not to be surprised by any fiery ordeal, which can be any kind of intensive, uncomfortable, unwelcome, unfriendly, unhappy experience that we go through in our life. That it's the idea that if we are in Christ, then there are no accidental experiences or encounters, that my life is hidden Christ, and if I'm following him, I'm following his plan. And his plan, as we see in the lives of many of those great leaders in Scripture, uh, weren't always leading them into the easiest things. Think about David when he writes in the 23rd Psalm and he says, Lo, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death. I mean, who in the world wants to go through the shallow valley of the shadow of death? Uh, many people think, if you've ever been to Israel, they talk about that deep ravine that goes from uh, the Kidron Valley in Jerusalem all the way down to the Dead Sea. Uh, water flows down into it most of the year. But it's so deep and cavernous and it's so steep and we used to drive along it. But in the ancient days, as it is again today, it's not a safe route to take for travelers because of criminals that are active along that road. And so as a consequence, uh, he, when he talks about the valley of the shadow of death, many people think that is the valley that he's talking about, where you would go up from Jericho up to Jerusalem. And it was a place like in the story of the Good Samaritan uh, took place along this value. Uh, the, the travelers beaten and left for dead. And the Samaritan, who he calls a Good Samaritan, which the Jews would have considered an oxymoron, but nonetheless, he took time to care for this man who had been wounded and left there for dead. And so that was kind of an idea of what David was talking about, the valley, the shadow of death. And it, these were scary places. They were deadly places. They were dangerous places. And there are in our life choices that we're asked to make where if we follow Christ into certain situations, it's kind of like going into the tunnel of chaos. We don't know uh, when we're going to come out on the other side. We don't know what the ultimate result is going to be. And, but we're called by Christ to take steps of faith, to trust him in what we're doing. And uh, it's interesting because there are some things that I have found in my life are easy to trust the Lord. I mean, in terms of doing something like this or sharing with you, uh, there's a great opportunity for me to say something really regrettably stupid and I wish I never had. Uh, but at the same time, I've done it so many times and I'm fairly confident that not only will God guide and direct me and keep me from doing that, but I'm counting on your graciousness to forgive me when I do. So, and, and, and that has proved to be true over time. But one of the things I would say is that we have to really begin to uh, think about life from a whole different perspective because the tendency for many people, particularly in the American culture, is to think that every day and every way is going to get better and better, that we are going to be uh, more fabulously happy and, and that we're owed a certain kind of level of positive mental attitude, that we should always have a smile on our face. Um, and we overlook the fact that there's a whole lot of weeping and, and heartbreak and disappointment and hardship that God's people have gone through throughout history and certainly is, is illustrated within scriptures. And so that's one of the things why Peter says to us, when those difficult things happen, when hardships happen, don't be surprised. In other words, don't be knocked off your feet and be stunned and wonder what in the world is happening. Because I've been that place where something bad happens. You go, why, God, did you let this happen? Couldn't you have kept it from happening? Why didn't you stop it from happening? And sometimes it can take a while before you begin to recognize and understand that God was in it the whole time that God is using this in your life and he's teaching you through this experience. I know that for myself in many ways, I'm a vastly different person than I was 10 years or 20 years ago because of the things that have broken my heart, things that you've gone through and been very wounded and disappointed by. And yet at the end of the day, I find that you survive that and you come out on the other side, particularly if you Follow the disciplines of praying for those who despitefully use you and forgiving those who are your enemies and, and wishing God to do the best. In fact, I find if you have people in your life who are 
uh, really difficult for you to get over. You're carrying a, a, a root of bitterness. I mean, that's how it goes. You know, we become resentful over something somebody does. We become bitter over time, and then we become malicious. We want to see the harm come their way. And I found that that is a trap because it, it defiles your whole being, as what the writer of Hebrews said. And it makes you pretty useless for God's kingdom. God doesn't use bitter people. He just puts them on the shelf until their bitterness subsides. And the fastest way to get bitterness to subside is to simply humble ourselves before the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me. I confess what I'm feeling. I confess that I'm not I'm showing the character of Christ. I confess that I hate this person. I resent this person. I want to hurt this person. You know, whatever's there, I always say, be honest with God. Tell him the truth. Don't lie to yourself because you're only lying to him and vice versa. And so but when you confess your sins, he says not only does he forgive you, but he starts fixing you. You'll find God will set you free from that resentment. And that freedom is where you want to be. You want to be not where your life is controlled by what other people have done to you in the past. You don't, they're not, it's not like you forget what happened, but it no longer is a reference point in your mind for what you're doing today. I don't always go back to that same thing and say, they did this to me, and then it begins to obscure and twist everything I'm doing on this side of my life. No, I just basically turn that over to God. God, they're your problem. You need to work and deal with them, them in their life. I'm just going to focus on Jesus and uh, follow you and, and, and let you accomplish what you want. But that brings the bigger question then is, why does God do this? What is ultimately the objective? And that's where Peter goes on and says that the purpose of the fiery ordeal, whatever that might be in your life, is to test you. And the simplest translation of this word to test means to prove that something is genuine. I mean, think about it when you were in school, you may still be in school, uh, but when you take a test, one of the things I learned, I, I took a course in, in writing tests at one point when I was working as, a, as an educator. And one of the things that was really interesting is the instructor said that if, you, if the students get 100% on the test, you fail to write the right kind of test, that you need to write a test in a way that tests their, the highest level of their knowledge and their comprehension. And so the test is meant to be a challenge. It's meant to reveal what you know, but also to reveal what you do not know. And so God, in a way, takes us through situations that are not only there to demonstrate what we know and what we don't know, but also to teach us that we have still more to learn and to grow in. Uh, there are things that were huge issues for me when I was a younger Christian that today are not. I mean, I, I've seen God so faithfully work in those areas of my life so many times that I don't really get stressed about them. Uh, but there are other things that do stress me. <coughs> I remember when trusting God for $20 or $100 seemed monumental to me. And yet over the years, I've seen God provide millions of dollars. And uh, not because I was sharp, clever, and shrewd, or knew how to manipulate the situation. You just simply said, God, if this is what you want, then guide direct us to the right end. And you'll see that God begins to move the universe and move circumstances. And even when we talk about things like physical ailments and, and needs for healing, that if God wants me to be healed of something, he's going to heal me. He doesn't always heal me instantaneously. I'll always say I've seen instantaneous healing and I've experienced it for myself. But I find that oftentimes I find that I go through a process. And I think going through the process of healing has taught me to make changes in my lifestyle. I mean, you change your diet, you just, you know, you bring in exercise and you begin to realize the importance of sleep and you begin to recognize that we all have psychic uh, mental limits that we can be pushed beyond. So it's one of those things that we just grow and learn as a consequence. And I think it's like Paul when he came to the Lord with his infirmity in the flesh. And some people try to say, well, his infirmity wasn't sickness, but clearly the most obvious and literal translation of Paul's statement in, in 2 Corinthians 12 about his infirmity, literally the term that's used there is, is almost exclusively used to a physical ailment or weakness. And he, he says that uh, he prayed three times that God would take that from him. And God's response was, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And I know that was a big one for me because I look at how God tested Abraham 
And then God says after that in Genesis 22, in verse 12, he says, now I know that you fear God. And it's kind of interesting because God knows everything, but it's only as we respond to God is there really evidence that we trust God. Visible evidence, not for God, but for us and everybody else around. And so when God says, I know that you fear God, he wants you to fear God in a way that other people know that you are a man or woman who fears God and it sets apart. Yeah, and so I, I think it's really important. Think about the, the faith it must have taken Abraham to trust God in that situation. But uh, I have to stop now because I've, I'm over my time, but we'll get into this a little bit further. I want to just continue to talk a little bit about Abraham and the struggle he went through and how strange that trial must have been. So look forward to continuing the conversation tomorrow. Many blessings.